Columbia Network takes pride in presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the fourth broadcast of a unique new series dramatizing famous narratives by great authors. This is the first time that a complete theatrical producing company has been brought to radio. And the Columbia Network again welcomes Mr. Wells and his associates to its own stations and to the stations of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Coast to Coast. Every week, Orson Wells invites our listeners to suggest their favorite titles. And tonight, the Mercury Theater on the Air presents 39 Steps by John Bucket, with Orson Wells as Richard Hannay and Marmaduke Joffrey. Here is Orson Welles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot divulge the full name of the author of the 39 Steps. Seven university degrees and a title make him a gentleman and a scholar and also practically unpronounceable. But I think you'd like to know, if you didn't, that it is the present Governor General of the Dominion of Canada and first Baron of Tweedsmuir who perpetrated this tall and shamelessly exciting spy story about high doings in Scotland. Lord Tweedsmuir, who in private life is a publisher, is himself very properly a Scotsman, who regards the sensational diversity of his responsibilities with the special calm of his nation. I regard my business, he says, as my profession. Writing as my amusement and politics is my duty. Flat 2C. 
A woman. Oh, stand there in a bowler hat. Is the old chap? You, you old bill collector? No. 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 Don't stutter. Speak up. Well, I'll tell you what I saw. I saw an old, old lady in a tippet just sitting there. All right, through the keyhole. I'm not ashamed. I looked through the keyhole, and there was this old, old lady sitting in a chair in Richard Hanley's apartment. You know what? Her wig was crooked. Yes, sir. And the phone kept ringing. And she didn't answer it. She just sat there. She just sat there. With her eyes open. Come on, Charlie. Off to the lead now. Here you are, Dirk Creighton. What is it all? How old are you, Penny? Charlie, seven. Just turn seven, ain't you, Charlie? Yeah, that's big boy, Charlie, for your age. Feet out, run and off. Thank you. They do sprout up, don't they? Mind the lollipop now, Charlie. Did you? I'm sorry. I haven't got one. Here now, what is this? Sorry, I didn't have time. I had to run to make it. Oh, I said, where to? Uh, where to? Newton Stewart. Eight and four. There you are. Eight and four. They had a ten and six and penalty for making the ticket while in front. Aren't you all set? Thank you. Uh, Here, yeah, sell it, Joe. Doom we are stuck. Doom. I can't see why passengers have to put up with that sort of thing. And the least now, mind her as he goes. Well then, Charlie, well then, don't give your lollipop to the doggy. Doom, Scott. Things are overcrowded as it is without bringing in a lot of smelly brutes, I must say. Excuse me, sir, while I open the window. Very well. Some people are never satisfied. Never you mind, Charlie, the dog is man's truest friend. Never mind what anybody may say. All right, lady, all right. I consider myself ticked off. And always remember, Charlie, that a man who doesn't like a dog is no friend of yours. You can be sure that Richard Annie didn't keep a dog. Not him, the murderer. No man who could do in a poor old lady through the art in his flat would keep a dog. No, Charlie. Do John. Do Curious case, that Portland Place murder affair, isn't it, sir? I, I'm great about it. You know, I'm always interested in a good murder. Here we are, sir. These Guardian Chronicles, special edition. I haven't seen this one myself yet. Stocking occurrence in Portland Square. Milkman's story. Annie disappears. Seen us in Pancras. Hello. Yes, odd one. Now look at this, sir. Yes. There's reason to believe that the suspect Richard Annie is headed north of the tree. Scotland Yard is searching all Great Northern trains. I say Great Northern. Why, that's us. Oh, shut your gab. What are you trying to do? Frighten the kitty? All right, lady. Sorry. It may be he's sitting here the new in his very compartment among us. In the blood of the slain not dry on his hands. June Doctor, where well, we'll soon settle that. Here it is. It light, hair brown, eyes blue, mustache, about thirty five, wearing a great sweet suit. Let's look at his picture now. Here it is. Turn to page seventeen. 
I shall be dead. That's what he told me the minute he got in the door. The little man was scared stiff. I could see that. He carried a parcel under his arm, a brown paper parcel, and there was a trickle of blood on his left hand from a fresh cut across the knuckles. There's going to be a war. Now, wait a minute. That's what he told me. A war. And this war is going to come as a great surprise to Britain. Somebody's going to be murdered. He he told me this Thursday night, the Thursday night. In London, a fellow called Carolides... Oh, nothing on earth can save him. But that's just a beginning. According to what this fellow told me, Carolides isn't important, not in himself. It's what comes after he's dead. On July 15th, the chief of the French general staff will be in London. On that day, the British Admiralty is to give him a complete statement of the disposition of the entire British fleet on mobilization. At least, at least I gather it's something like that, something uncommonly important. Now then, on the 15th of July, there will be others in London. I don't know who. He had a name for them. The name of some... He called them the Black Stone. But well, somehow this information, those secrets about our fleet destined for France will be diverted into their hands on that day, July 15th, and will be used, used, remember, a week or two later against England by our deadly foe with great guns and swift torpedoes suddenly in the darkness of a summer night. I know you don't believe this. I didn't when he told it. I do now. Well, I noticed that while this man Skoda was talking, he kept fingering a little black notebook which was full of writing, some sort of code it looked like. You may believe me or not, just as you please. There it is. This is the fellow speaking, the fellow with the brown paper parcel and the cut across his knuckles. This is what he said. Yes, for this information. I got this first hint nearly two years ago in an inn on the Atkinsay in Tyrol. I collected my other clues in a fur shop in the Galician quarter of Budapest, in a stranger's club in Vienna, in a little bookshop in the Rettenstrasse in Leipzig. I completed my evidence ten days ago in Paris. And until yesterday, I thought that I had worked on observe. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. For me. Those men calling, see if I'm here. Don't answer it. Here. Let me show you something. Will you please turn up the light? Yes. Come to the window. Look. Down there. Well, I looked. For a moment I saw nothing but the deserted street below. Then I noticed a man in a bowler hat standing in a doorway across the street. When I came home last night, I found a card in my letter box. Here it is. Hmm. The Black Stone. What's the Black Stone? Well, that's the name. That's what they call themselves, these people. When I got that card, I knew that I had to die. Why don't you call the police? Well, it's no use. These men followed me here. I'm bottled in this building as sure as a pickled herring. Well, that, that's why I'm telling you all these things tonight. If I fail... Well, I, I should hate to leave this scene without leaving somebody behind to put over a fight. Well, I still didn't know what to make of the little chap, and it was getting late. So I made him a bed in my smoking room. Good night. Good night. And in case I'm not here in the morning, I haven't the privilege of your name, sir, but let me tell you, you're a white man. Oh, I say, before you go to bed, I thank you to lend me a razor. I locked the door of my room. Finally, I fell asleep. 
I woke before dawn, couldn't go to bed again. I lit a cigarette and started to read. Then I noticed that the light in the smoking room was still on. I got up, I had a cigarette in my mouth, I remember. And as I pushed open the smoking room door, I saw something that made me drop my cigarette. Bolt upright in a chair by the window sat an old woman with her eyes open. There was a long knife through her heart which skewered her to the back of a chair. I looked quickly about and called for Skoda. There was no reply. Then I noticed three things. First, the old woman's wig had fallen slightly askew. Second, that the brown paper parcel I'd noticed under Skoda's arm the night before was now lying open and empty on the table. Third, that across the knuckles of the old woman's left hand was a fresh, unhealed cut. From the limpness of the body, I estimated that Skoda had been dead for about two hours. I wondered what had happened to the little black book. I searched Skoda's body and found nothing. Then I noticed that the whole flat had been ransacked in the night. The inside of the book's drawers covered even the sideboard in the dining room. I shut it and bolted every door and window in the flat. Skoda's story was true. The men who knew that he knew what he knew had found him and had made certain of his silence. You see, his disguise had not saved him. I'd be the next to go. But suppose... Suppose I went out now and called the police. What kind of a story could I tell about Skoda? If I told them the truth, they'd simply laugh at me. I'd be charged with murder. The best I could hope for was jail. And that was just what they wanted for me. An English prison was as good a way of getting rid of me till after July 15th as a knife in my chest. I got out an atlas and looked at a big map of the British Isles. My notion was to get off to some wild district, some open space where my South African experience would be of help to me. Some place where I'd be safe hiding for six days until July 15th. And I decided Scotland would be best. There was a train from St. Pancras at 7.10. I went to the window and looked out between the shutters. It was beginning to get light. I saw a man standing in the doorway in a bowler hat. Then another man, who seemed to be drunk, came down in evening dress down the street. He walked unsteadily. He caught sight of the man in the bowler hat and went over and spoke to him. Then he crossed the street and came into the house. Throw my pouch from the tobacco jar on the table by the fireplace. As I poked into the tobacco, my fingers touched something hard, and I drew out Skoda's little black book. Somehow that seemed a good omen. I went out of the street, past the doorway, past the man in the bowler hat, and at 7.10 I was at St. Pancras Station. <laughs> Good mile from the train.
track before I stopped running. The moor. It's all around me. You couldn't have found a more peaceful landscape in the world, yet at that moment, for the first time in my life, I felt the terror of the hunted on me. It wasn't the police I was afraid of, but the others who knew that I knew Skoda's secret and dared not let me live. They had killed Skoda in my flat within a few yards of me. Now it was my turn. And I didn't even know what these men looked like. I wish I'd listened more carefully to what Skoda had said about them. I... I think he said there were three of them. And that one of them was young and dark and one was plump and one was old and stammered sometimes when he spoke. Suddenly... In the blue evening sky, I saw something. Low down in the south, a monoplane was climbing into the heavens. I was as certain as if I'd been told that that aeroplane was looking for me. I ran most of the night, keeping always south in the direction of the hills. And as the mists cleared before the sun, I found myself in the central boss of a high upland country with glens falling away on every side. Then I saw the monoplane again, coming up from the east. Flying high. It circled about me in narrowing circles, the way a hawk wheels before it pounces. Now it was flying quite low. The observer on board caught sight of me. I could see him looking at me through the through glasses. No. I was speeding eastward again, but it became a speck in the blue morning. My enemies had located me. The next thing would be a cordon around me. There wasn't enough cover on the whole moor to hide a rat. I tossed a coin, heads right, tails left. Fell heads, so I turned north. For a while, I got to the mountain country and came to the brow of a ridge. Way down a slope a couple of miles away, several men were advancing like a row of beaters at a shoot. And it may have been my imagination, but I thought I saw figures, one, two, perhaps more, moving in a glen beyond the stream. I looked down into the valley. There were men below. Police, they looked like. Not more than a quarter of a mile off, spaced out on the hillside like a fan beating the heather. Hey, Joe! Hey! Oh, here you are listening to the Columbia Network's presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater in John Buchan's 39 Steps. We shall resume the story in a moment. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network is presenting 39 Steps by John Buchan. And now the Mercury Theater resumes the story with Orson Welles as Richard Hannay and Marmaduke Jopley. We were playing hare and hounds. Please and I. Soon it began to seem less of a game. The police had evidently called in the local herds of gamekeepers. These fellows were hefty men on the native heath. Looking back, I saw that 
Only three were following me. The others had fetched a circuit to cut me off. I crossed a burn and came out on a road which seemed to be kept with some care. A few hundred yards to my left, I saw the chimneys of a house smoking. There was a veranda in front of the house. And through the grass, I saw the face of an elderly gentleman meekly watching me. Hurry, my friend. His face was round and shiny, like Mr. Pickwick's, and the top of his head was as bright and bare as a glass bottle. Through the window could be seen some figures half a mile off. Oh, I see. Fugitive from justice, eh? Well, we go into the matter at our leisure. Go into my study. You see two doors facing you. Take the one to the left and close it behind you. Close it tight. I did as I was told. <laughs> I was in a little dark chamber that smelled of chemicals. I wasn't any too happy. There was something about the old gentleman which. Rather terrified me. He'd been too easy and ready. Almost as if he'd been expecting me, and his... His eyes had been horribly intelligent. All right. You may come out now. <clears throat> have they gone? They have gone. I convinced them that you had crossed the hill. I do not choose that the police should come between me and one whom I am delighted to honor. He smiled gently and nodded to the door behind me. I turned and saw two manservants who had me covered with pistols. This is a lucky morning for you, Mr. Richard Hanney. Hey, what's going on here? And who are you calling Richard Hanney? My name's Ainsley. So? Oh, but of course you have many names. We won't quarrel about a name... Mr. Hanley. And now I suppose you're going to give me up after all. And a little dirty trick I call it. Far go, I wish I'd never seen that cursed money. Here it is in big dance here. You are a clever actor, Mr. Hanley, but not quite clever enough. Oh, no, I shall not give you up. My friends and I will have a little private settlement with you to... tonight. Ah, oh, for... Hey, stop jawing. Everything's against me. What's the arm of a poor devil with an empty stomach picking up some money finds in a lost pocket? Like, that's all I've done. And for that, I've been shivered for two days with his blasted bodies over these blasted hills. I could see a dawning of a doubt in his mind. Well, I'll tell you, I'm fair sick of it. Will you oblige me with a story of your recent doings, Mr. Hanley? I can't, Governor. I've not had a bite for two days. Give me a mouthful of food, and then you'll hear God, too. You're a good liar, Hanley. But I do not propose to let you go. If you are what you say you are, you will soon have a chance of clearing yourself. If you're what I think you are, I do not think you will see the light much longer. Is ring, sir? And there are some nice things that you still come. Yeah, yeah. I want the Daimler in five minutes. There will be three to dinner. Goodbye, Mr. Hanning. We will meet again t t tonight. I marched out of the room with a pistol in the small of my back. <clears throat> they locked me up again in a small dark chamber that smelled of chemicals that was as black as pitch. Well, I made out that the walls were lined with boxes and barrels and sacks of some heavy stuff. The old boy had gone off in the car to collect his friends and be back soon. The plump one and the dark thin one. But I figured it out. I had just about two hours longer to live. And I, I thought of Skoda dressed up like an old woman. Sitting in that chair by the window in my flat with his eyes open. I got up and started moving around the room again. I found a handle in the wall, the door of a cupboard of some sort. And in that cupboard, there were bottles and cases of queer-smelling stuffs and coils of fine copper wire. There was a box of detonators and a lot of cord for fuses. Also, half a dozen little gray bricks. I took up one and smelled it and put it in my tongue. 
A bit of mining engineer for nothing. I know. Lent tonight when I see it. It was a risk. But if I didn't take it, I'd probably be occupying a six-foot hole in the garden by evening anyhow. So, took a quarter of a lanternite brick and buried it near the door, and then I got a detonator and a couple of feet of fuse. And then, I lit a match. Something had hit my left shoulder. There was a poisonous yellow fog all around me. Somewhere behind me, I felt fresh air. I started to run. I ran. Much later, in a clearing on a hillside, I saw a small stone building with a tower. The door was open. It was dark and cool inside. I Staggered in and sat down on one of the benches. The pain in my shoulder was unbearable. Then I heard steps coming down the path. I found a small door in one corner and narrow stairs running up to the tower. I went up. And most of the top of this tower was taken up with bells. But there was a small ledge outside just wide enough to lie down on. I heard a man downstairs below me. In the tower. my enemies. They weren't after me. They didn't even know I was there. They were peacefully walking to church with their families. It was Sunday. Presently, a large green open damer drove up. Three men got out. My plump friend, the professor, and the dark young man. I could see them looking up at my tower. Two of them went into the church. The thin man stayed at the car. I waited up there on the ledge. But they didn't come up. They left me there. The service had just begun. That gave me about an hour... Now, there was an old iron drain pipe running along the corner of the tower. It didn't seem particularly solid. Besides, I was in full sight of the man in the car. At that moment, it started to rain. The man in the car looked up at the sky. He turned his collar, then he shrugged his shoulders, got out of the car and went into the church.
I started down the side of the tower. Halfway down, my foot slipped and I fell. The ground was soft. I got up and went over the car and drove off. I drove that dame up raw. She was worse. It was risky driving with my right arm on an action. But I drove on south, downhill into the valley. The road was full of sharp curves and shiny under my headlights and very slippery. <laughs> That's right, Sullivan. Mr. Haley, I may talk like an ass most of the time, but I can size up a man. The whiskey, sir. Uh, thanks, Sullivan. Pull it, will you? Two stiff ones. Very good, sir. My name is Henry. Well, Henry, you're no murderer and you're no fool. And I believe you're speaking the truth. I'm going to back you up. Now, what can I do? I've got to get in touch with the government sometime before June 15th. Uh, July 15th. That's the day after tomorrow. If you can help me. All right, I will. The permanent secretary of the foreign office is my cousin and one of the best going. He's down at his cottage in the country. Stop, did you? If you stop early tomorrow morning, uh, Sullivan. Yes, sir. Have the station wagon here at six in the morning. Yes, sir. And reserve a compartment on the Southern Express. Yes, sir. Oh, in Sullivan. Yes, sir. Hannah. Send a telegram to Sir Walter. Yes, sir. If a man called... Hannah. Hannah. Then uh, better not use my real name. So right you are. If a man calls, uh, um... Sullivan, you will think of a name for Mr. Hannay? Yes, sir. A short name, sir. Yes, Sullivan. Uh, and British, of course. Sir. Oh, yes, Sullivan. You can count on me, sir. Sir Walter Bullivant. Kenneth Gear Arkins Well, Cambridge, sir. If a man called Swisden appears tomorrow, treat him kindly. He may tell you something. It will wake you up. He will pass the word black stone and whistle and in lorry. Love, Harry. Fishing against any river in England. Hmm. He's that big fellow there. Four pounds if he's an odd. Hmm. Well, I've seen him, sir. there. Yards from the weeds, just as I've left sticking. Oh, yes, I see him now. He's a big fellow. I swear it was a black stone. Yes. something that would wake me up. I'm ready. Oh, uh, Mr. Henry, before we begin, I think I'll tell you, I got a letter from Skoda this morning. Skoda? Yes. Skoda's been dead a week. It was written on the 8th, the day before he came to you. His letter usually took a week to reach me. They were sent undercover to Spain and then to Newcastle. What did he say? Great deal. Strange fellow, Skoda. He knew more international secrets than any secret service man in Europe. The trouble about him was he liked to play a lone hand and never tell us all he knew. Besides, he was getting romantic. Black stone. Like any novelette. Sir Walter, is Carolitis in London? He is. Been there for days. In his letter, did Stoda say anything about Premier Carolitis? Premier Carolitis? Stoda said that the 14th of July today, Carolitis would be murdered. Carolitis murdered? Nonsense. There's no state in Europe, once came out of the way. Virtuous Carolides is like safely to outlive us all. I'm afraid Skoda went off the trail there. Uh, so... Yes, he followed it. Telegram to Walter. That came through from London. Thanks. Uh, you excuse me, Mr. Henry? Keith, car right away. 
Call the foreign office. Tell them I'm on my way up. Yes, sir. I apologize to the shade still, but Carol Ides was shot dead this evening, a few minutes after seven. It begins to look like war, Mr. Hedden. Now, what about our naval plans, Walter? You know what Skoda said about them? He said tomorrow, July 15th. We are taking no chances, Mr. Hedden. General Dufour, chief of the French general staff, arrived in London at five today. He dines with the Prime Minister, and then he goes to the Foreign Office. So four people will see him. Whitaker from the Admiralty, myself, Sir Arthur Drew, and General Winstanley. Lord Sterling may be there. You never know about him. He gets more erratic every day. The Foreign Office, General Dufour, will get a certain document from Whitaker. After that, he'll be motored to Portsmouth, where a destroyer will take him to Hart. He won't be left unattended for a moment until he's safe in Paris. The same with Whitaker till the papers are out of his hands. And I don't think that missing, I'm horribly nervous. So, Walter, if those plans were stolen, could the disposition be changed? We can't make any serious change in those dispositions, Mr. Henry, unless we alter the geography of England. gentlemen, that our meeting is over, I must ask you to give me a few minutes longer of your time. Gentlemen, I ask you to meet Mr. Hannay. How do you do, Mr. Hannay? General Dufour. I'd like to meet you. Sir Arthur yes. Drew. How do you do, sir? John Whitaker. How do you do, sir? General Winstanley. How do you do? Gentlemen, I think the highly unusual step of asking Mr. Hannay to attend our meeting tonight because Mr. Hannay is in possession of a certain vital information which every one of us here... Yeah. Uh, sorry, Walter. I am a sick man. I'm going back to my bed where I belong. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, Good night, night, Good night. Good night Mr. Hannay. Sorry I can't stay to hear what you've got to say. Oh, and uh, Whitaker, whatever comes up, you take care of it. Don't call me again t- tonight. Stop that man. Really? I tell you to stop that man. Stop him. Mr. Henry, I think you're forgetting yourself. I beg of you to stop him. If you won't, I will. Too late. Gentlemen. Who do you think went through that door a minute ago? Lord Sterling. He did not. It was his living image, but it was not Lord Sterling. Gentlemen, have you ever known Lord Sterling to stammer? Stammer? Henry, have you gone out of your head? I tell you, gentlemen, that man who just went out was not Lord Sterling. It was someone who recognized me. Someone I've seen in the last three days. Nonsense. Really, Mr. Henney, I think you have gone out of your head. That remains to be seen. So, Walter, may I call Lord Sterling's house? I'll do it. Hello? If you wouldn't say house. Hurry, please. Hello? Yes? Hello? This is Walter Pullivan. Will you ask Lord Sterling to call me the minute he gets home? What? What's that? Are you sure? I see. Thanks. Lord Sterling hasn't been out of his bed all day. He went to sleep at six and woke up a few minutes ago. Well, then, who was it? The black stone. But it's madness. Do you mean to tell me that that man came here and sat beside me for the best part of an hour, and I didn't detect the imposter, my own chief? You were too interested in other things to have the use of your eyes. You took Lord Sterling for granted. If it had been anybody else, you might have looked more closely. The thing that puzzles me is, oh, what good would his visit uh, here do that fellow, the spy fellow? Here are the plans right here on his table. He couldn't carry away several pages of figures and strange names in his head. Yes, he could. A trained spy has a photographic memory. You noticed he said nothing, but went through those papers again and again. Those plans were as lost to us as if he had them in his pocket. Give me the home office. Port division. Have every port watched. Every outgoing steamer checked. And we have not a rag of a clue. I wonder. Sir Walter, here's Skoda's little black book. It's in code, except for one sentence scroll over the last page. Skoda knew where those fellows would hide. He knew when they were going to leave the country. I wonder if in that sentence... What is it? Let's hear it. Thirty-nine steps. I counted them, high tide, 
10.17 p.m. 39 steps. That is a clue, don't you see? And it was someplace where high tide was at 10.17. There are at least a hundred places in England where the uh, tide's high at 10.17 tomorrow. Well, they've gone to Lewis. Not they. They have their own secret plans, and they won't be hurried. 39 steps. What does he mean by steps? Dock steps. Then he, he wouldn't have mentioned their number. It, it must be a place where there's more than one set of stairs. Home office. Department of Transportation. Hello. Bullivan speaking. I say, is there any regular steamer leaving for the continent at 10.17 p.m.? Look it up. What? You sure? Thanks. There's no regular steamer sailing for the continent at 10.17 p.m. from anywhere. Then it must be a private boat and a little port. That explains why the tide's important. Hello? Give me the admiral tape. Hello? Walter Bullowin speaking. Hello, Jenkins. What places do you know along the east coast where there are cliffs? There are several sets of steps run down to the beach. They mean steps, regular staircases. What's that? Place in Norfolk? Brattleton? The golf course? No, that's not it. No, no, marine stairs won't do either. Has to be more retired than that. What? That else? Think, man, think. It's important. What's that? What you call it? The rough? Listen to this. A big chalk headland in Kent, close to Bradgate. Sir Arthur, mm -hmm. look up the Admiralty tie table. Bradgate, Kent. Yes, yes. A lot of villas on top of the cliff, and some of the houses have staircases down to a private beach. All right, Sir Arthur. Here, listen to this. Bradgate, high tide, July the 15th, 10.17 p.m. <laughs> Confidential report. Richard Hannay, special agent to Sir Walter Bullivant, permanent secretary in the Foreign Office. There is a villa with 39 steps leading down to the sea. The Fargo Lodge, it's called, sir. Belongs to an old gentleman called Appleton, a retired stockbroker. Well, here's what happened. At about six that evening, I saw the yacht, the foreign steam yacht. Came up from the south and dropped anchor pretty well opposite the rough. Then, later, our British destroyer came in. At half past nine, I strolled towards Trafalgar Lodge. The Scotland Yard men would be posted around the house by now, but there was no sign of a soul. The house stood as open and public as a charity bazaar. Yes, sir? Does Mr. Appleton live here? Yes, sir. I'd like to see him, please. I'll see if he's in. Will you wait here in the hall, please, sir? I found myself in a neat hall. There were the golf clubs and tennis rackets which you'll find in 10,000 British homes. There was, uh, you know, Grandfather Clark taking a barometer and a print of children winning the Grand National. What name shall I say, sir? Hannay. Will you come this way, please, sir? Mr. Annie. The old man rose to meet me. He was in evening dress. So was the plump one. The third, the dark one, wore a blue serge suit and the colors of some club or school. Mr. Hannay, you wish to see me? One moment, you fellows, I'll join you. Better go to the smoking room, Mr. Hannay. We'll stay here. I think we've met before. I guess you know my business. Maybe, sir, maybe. I haven't a very good memory. I'm afraid you must tell me your errand, for I really don't know it. Well, then, I've come to tell you that the game's up. I have a warrant here for the arrest of you three. Arrest? Really? Yes. Good Lord, what for? For the murder of Nathan Skoda in London on the eighth day of this month. Why, I've never heard the name before. Good heaven, you must be mad, sir. Where did you come from? Scotland Yard. Why, don't get flustered. That's a ridiculous mistake. 
Well, these things happen sometimes. Well, we can easily set it right. I can show that I was out of the country on the 8th. And Bob was down here. You were in London, but of course you can explain what you were doing. Right, Percy. Of course, that's easy enough. The 8th, uh, last Thursday. Why, that was the day after Agatha's wedding. Let me see, what was I doing? I came up in the morning from Woking and lunched at the club with Charlie Simons. Uh, oh, yes. Then I dined at the City Hall, I remember. But the punch didn't agree with me. I was seedy next morning. Hang it all, there's the cigar box I brought back from the dinner. <laughs> Think what Aunt Nellie will say. She always said you'd die of boredom because nothing ever happened to you, and now you've got it thick and strong. <laughs> Why, that's wonderful. By <laughs> Jove, yes, just think of it. What a story to tell at the club. Really, Mr. Hanny, I suppose I should be angry to show my innocence, but it's too funny. I almost forgive you the fright you gave me. You looked so glum, I thought I might have been walking in my sleep and killing people like Jack the Ripper. <laughs> It couldn't be acting. It was too confounded genuine. Well, my heart went in my boots. My first impulse was to apologize and clear out. And yet, there were three of them. And one was old. And one was plump. And one was lean and dark. And their house fitted in with Scudder's notes. And half a mile offshore was lying a foreign yacht. There's only one thing to do. Go forward if I had no doubts. I was going to make a fool of myself. I might as well do it handsomely. Then I remembered what old Peter Penny always told me in Rhodesia, the scar ever knew. He told me once, talking about disguises, that barring certainties like fingerprints, mere physical traits are of very little importance. If a man really knows his business, well, he laughed at things like dyed hair and false beards and such childish follies. If a man really knew his business, if you're playing a part, you'll never keep it up unless you convince yourself that you really are the man you're pretending to be. So I walked to the door and switched on the electric light. And the sudden glare made them blink, and I stood scanning the three faces while I made nothing of it. One was old and bald, one was stout, one was dark and thin. That's all I could tell. Perhaps they were the three men who had hunted me in Scotland. Perhaps they weren't. There was a silver cigarette box on the table beside me, and I saw that it had been won by Percy Appleton, Esquire, for St. Bede's Club in a golf tournament. Well, are you reassured by your scrutiny? I make no complaint, but you see how annoying it must be to respectable people. Are you going to drop it? No. Oh, Lord, this is a bit too thick. Do you propose to march us off to the police station? Mm -hmm. I have the right to ask you your warrant, you know, but I don't wish to cast any aspersions upon you, sir. You're only doing your duty, but <laughs> you will admit it's horribly awkward, or... What do you propose to do? Well, I vote we have a game of billiards. It will give Mr. Hanny time to think things over and show him there's no ill feeling. Do you play, sir? Yes, I play. The billiard room is downstairs, Mr. Hanny. Why don't you two start? We'll finish our cigars and come down later. Oh. We went to the billiard room. Choose your cue, sir. Thanks. Play no spot, sir. Spot? Short? Thanks. How about a few practice shots? Good work, Mr. Hanny. I'm afraid you're in for a licking, Bob. Should we start? We'll begin. Or should we talk? What are you playing for? Chilling a game? It's all right. Heads or tails, Mr. Hanny? Heads. Heads it is. You begin. Oh. Will you mark for us, Percy? I do. Seven. That was a near one, rough luck. Five. Eight. That's all. All right, Mr. Hanny. Uh, five. That's, uh, thirteen. Seventeen. Good work. Stop at seventeen. Oh, Percy, look at the time. You'd better think about catching your train. Yes, yes certainly. He's got to go to town tonight. I'm afraid you must put off your journey. Oh, dash it all, Hanny. I thought you'd drop that one. I've simply got to go. You can have my address and you can have any security you like. No, you must stay. It was five minutes after ten and twelve minutes. It would be high tide. Through the window, I could see the lights of the foreign yacht, the yacht oh, offshore. No bail for my nephew. That ought to content you, Mr. Hanny. Was it my fancy or did I detect some halt in the smoothness of that voice? And then, then I... I thought of something. 
Mr. Appleton, when does your nephew have to be in London? Tonight. And you say you would go bail for him, Mr. Appleton? Yes. Yes, I told you I would. Well, then, perhaps, if I could arrange to call Scotland Yard early in the morning... No, no Mr. Hanley. It simply has to be tonight. Then I knew who he was. young dark man leaped from the window. He threw it over the low fence and down the steps before a hand could reach him. Someone switched on the light. The plump one was lying crumpled in a heap. They'd got handcuffs on the old man. Ah! He's safe! You can't follow him in time! He's gone on the earth! He's triumphed! The black stone has triumphed. I hope he'll bear his triumph well, Mr. Appleton. I ought to tell you that your yacht for the last two hours has been in our hands. Well, Sir Walter, that's about all there is to it. That's the story. If you ask me to set it down, you know the rest of it better than I do. Skoda was right about the war, right, wasn't he? In about a week, I expected right in the middle of it myself. Because of my Matabedi experience, I got a captain's commission straight off. I joined my division on Thursday at Aldershot, and I understand we'll be moving straight up the front. Still, I'm afraid I had most of my excitement before I put on cocky. Anyway, goodbye, and thanks for everything. It's great sport while it lasted. Yours, very sincerely, Richard Hanney. August 8, 1914. Tonight, the Columbia Network has brought you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in 39 steps by John Buchan. We now present the star and director of these broadcasts, who tonight played Richard Hannay, Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, if you miss Madeline Carroll in our... Tag version of 39 Steps, the young lady in the movie, in common with almost everything else in that movie, was the trial of its director's own unparalleled and unpredictable fancy. If you missed anything, you must blame Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. If you were surprised by anything, you must blame us. Well, next week, the Mercury Theater, by way of an experiment, attempts a radio anthology of short stories. Until then, good night, everybody, goodbye, and see you next week. <laughs>